Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Jennifer Fondreve. I will tell you all about Jennifer in just a moment. Grace Under Pressure is that show that deals with what's too often dismissed as the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment we exert toward others. And when you do it as a leader, as you will discover that Jennifer very much is, you do it with a singular purpose of bringing people together with common cause, but you do it in a way that adds dignity to others and respect. So Jennifer Fondreve, welcome to Grace Under Pressure. Thank you, John. Thank you. I want to tell everybody about you. Uh, Jennifer Fondreve is the founder of Day, Re Day One Ready, a consultancy that focuses on helping people understand the human capital element of mergers and acquisitions. She's a, as she says, a survivor of Fortune 500 M&A. Uh, and for that reason, that's why she focuses on it. Um, she is the author of the book, Now What? Which I like that title, Now What? A Survivor's Guide through mergers and acquisitions. Uh, she wrote an HBR, Harvard Business Review article on this after a merger, merger and thinking about what it's called, thinking ruin the company. That went viral. And uh, she realized, hey, there's a book in this. And she focused on it. She's a frequent guest on podcasts. And I'm fortunate to snag her for this one. Um, she's a, a speaker um, in many different places. Jennifer, welcome to Grace Under Pressure. So. Thank you very much for having me. As you joked, you know, you probably don't think about grace in the context of mergers and acquisitions. So I appreciate you going out on a limb to invite me. <laughs> well, uh, I, we learn from all things. And I know, Jennifer, you are a woman of grace, which we will discover as we talk. So how did you come to write now what? Well, I'm glad you liked the title of the, frankly, all credit for the title of my book, Now What? goes to my illustrator because uh, my book is illustrated and we were talking about it and he said, you know, having gone through mergers and acquisitions, you feel as a leader, you're constantly saying, now what? Right. Because the strategy tends to change a lot. Uh, and so really, uh, I wrote the book after going through three multi-billion dollar acquisitions. Um, the more famous one of the three that I went through is Naftec, a digital mapping company, was acquired by Nokia. Do you remember Nokia? Oh, oh, yes, I do. I actually use them quite a bit in Once Upon a Time in my writing and when I spoke about it. Yes. So. Yeah. So Nokia, uh, I thought it was a brilliant move on their part, recognized that people wouldn't just be connecting over the phone this way, but they would be connecting through using maps. And mm -hmm. so they acquired Navtech. Uh, but that acquisition, um, if you watch the press at all, did not necessarily uh, reach the success and the opportunity that it had. And after that first one, it really, I started to think there's got to be, there's got to be a better way to do M&A. And by the third yeah. time I went through an acquisition, I, I thought, okay, I don't see anybody doing a better way of M&A. Uh, and so my first step was to write I, what I jokingly say is a survivor's handbook, but it's really the intent is to help. It's to help the people who aren't in the room when the deal is made, but who are burdened mm -hmm. with the execution. And so I, I bring to life the things that I wish as an executive, someone had told me through the three M and a deals that I went through, right? The changes in personality when people are afraid, um, the stages of grief. Okay, let's, stop it, let's stop it right there. So a change in personality when we're afraid. So delve into that. What does that really mean? So. Well, when people are afraid, you, you tend not to see the best side of them, right? If they oh. go into survivor mode. Right. Uh, you know, and I jokingly even talk about in my book, if you ever watch the TV show Survivor, right? <laughs> people shift. Their, their allegiances shift. When they're, when they're just trying to survive. And the same can happen in a merger and acquisition when people are uncertain of the future. They don't know, are they still gonna have a job? Will they still have the same boss? Is their title gonna remain the same? And so you can see a different side of people. I intentionally made them caricatures. You just showed a few of them. And, and, and that is my cue because I, shame on me, I, I forgot to mention that. So tell us about these characters. We have two on the screen now, and we also have an audio audience, so I don't want to stay too long on that, but no uh, worries. two of these characters. Well, 
I can describe it, particularly for our audio audience. Um, the two are the former rock star. That's the caricature on the left. And then the Black Widow, the caricature. <laughs> I'll start with the, the former rock star, because um, actually I wrote a Fast Company article about this particular uh, character in particular, because during the pandemic, a lot of people had a hard time shifting, right? When the metrics for success change, you could have been a rock star in the former environment, but as those metrics change, if you aren't able to pivot or you resist pivoting, you know, if you think it's, it goes to Marshall Goldsmith's comment, right? What got you here won't get you there. You've got to be able to shift and adapt. And a former rock star becomes a former rock star be because of that inability to shift. Right. Because, and, and, and you know, we, um, that's a real uh, thing. Because if you're very, I wasn't going to say you're comfortable and people know you have credibility, and all of a sudden you might be a smaller fish in a big, in a bigger pond. And um, there's, is there a loss of confidence? Uh, Absolutely. Okay. Right? Because your value, the way you have perceived your value is attached to the past. It's attached to the past success metrics. And you have to acknowledge that things have changed. The metrics for success are changing. And so one of the things I, I talk about, particularly for that chapter, is so that you don't become a former rock star, you need to be open to what those metrics are changing into and actually see the opportunity to contribute your own metrics. Because particularly in an M&A, um, an acquisition environment, there's a lot of gray, right? There's the, the middle, middle, middle state before you get to the future state. And, uh, right. and so for former rock stars, that's a big focus um, that I have for them. One of the charms of your book is, of course, the illustrations. And so you have something called, we talked about the rock star. What does the, what is the black widow? <laughs> well, and I, I intentionally made them caricatures, John, because mm -hmm. I don't want people to judge the, the personalities that I saw emerge, right? Because we yeah. all, uh, repeatedly, everyone said, oh, I know one of these. And I've had more than one person say, oh my God, this was, this is me. This is how I was, right? The know all in particular. Uh, but the Black Widow is that person who presents as an ally, right? Who you think, and they could be uh, the company that you've been with that's acquired, or they could be someone from the other side. They present as an ally, but they're making you expendable. They are taking your information uh, and, and, and helping to elevate their stature while diminishing yours. And Ooh, how, how often we hear that. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, sometimes it's very blatant. Like I have been hired to, to train my successor, but I'm not leaving voluntarily. <laughs> so yeah. that type of thing. And, uh, so, and that's you know, um, the way you cast a humorous light on it and reveals a, a true problem. So, okay. So caricatures aside, these are reveal real situations. So what do leaders need? What three things do leaders need to exhibit during an M&A? So. Well, and, and it's fascinating because during the pandemic, I wrote about this uh, a lot. Uh, uh, again, another uh, article with Fast Company, right? Because we saw during the pandemic, everyone was faced with uncertainty. It's the same scenario in M&A. Because even if you've defined a strategy when you acquire or merge with another company, you don't know if it's going to work, right? It could be a great vision, but um, there's no certainty until you start to get into it. So everyone's facing uncertainty. So first and foremost, leaders have to recognize that their leadership toolbox, they need to go into a different part of the toolbox. Okay. Right? So, so, what, so what, what are the tools that are different in a time of uncertainty or ambiguity? So the communication cadence is different and the posture of communication, right? Mm -hmm. Now the communication is more about transparency, um, speaking plainly and consistently. And, you know, I, I, unfortunately I feel like this word is, is overused at the moment, but authentically, right? Here's right. what I know. Here's what I don't know. This is what we're working on. Right. But also recognizing as a leader that what you say, you can feel that you are very clear you have to know that everything's going to be interpreted at a different level. Right. So, I have I've, a story that comes to mind. A, a neighbor of mine actually um, had been um, 
a little bit older than me, but he said at one point, and it, this was his final stop, and he said, you know, I, he's a lifelong scientist, and he'd been in the pharmaceutical industry for his entire career, and he said, you know, and now he's a senior executive. He said, I've been through five of these, and none of them, <laughs> and tell me, it doesn't get any easier. Right. So one thing he told me with, brought to mind about what you said about transparency, because he told me that as a se senior leaders know more about the uh, the the deal or whatever, then they can reveal. So that puts them in a hard spot. Does it not, Jennifer? So. It does. It does. But I think that too often that's used as an excuse, <clears throat> right? Because you can reveal things that don't reveal the nature of the deal, right? So I, I'm talking about separate from absolutely there's confidentiality, there's legal ramifications you can't reveal up until well, here's the thing and that's the big question i know in every m a is uh what's in it to for me or what are they gonna do to me and that i think that was my i didn't stress the question enough so when there's talk of an, a merger or an acquisition people want to know will i still have a job so right. what does this i mean what does a manager senior leader say so, so actually a, a story uh, in response to that comes to mind, and I talk about this in the book, there was one leader uh, who I interviewed who actually talked about his boss during an M&A. And he said what he valued most about this boss's leadership is he said, listen, I know that we offer value to this company, but who knows? These new folks coming in, they might not see it. Don't stay attached to your title. Don't fixate on what role you had before. Demonstrate your ability to learn and how you can contribute that knowledge to the future vision of where this company is going. Because if you stay fixated on what you used to do and how you did it, then they aren't going to see how you're gonna to contribute to the future. So it was more about don't stay stuck in the past, don't stay stuck on your past achievements, but think about what is my skill set, what is the value that I can contribute and where do I see the gaps and opportunities for me to make a difference? And I thought that's absolutely the key, right? And he was very upfront. He said, I don't know. We could be, we could stay, but we might not. You need to act as though you're interviewing for your job again and, and, and focus on demonstrating in every opportunity the value you can contribute. Right. And that's very solid advice. And that's what I learned from my friend. And he taught, said, I, I, he was very straightforward with his people. He said, I don't know what the future will bring, but I will let you know what I can know as soon as I know it. So I will keep you in the loop. So, but yes. I think you have to still com keep communicating. Do you not? Absolutely. Uh, oh. and, and, and it sounds as though your friend did this as well. You need to solicit feedback. You need to constantly be asking for what are challenges you're facing? What are obstacles that are in your way as a result of this? Because if people, people can often feel worried about asking questions, right? They don't want to put a target on their back. They don't want to look like they're not in the know. But the more you solicit uh, questions and frankly, the more you champion. When someone asks a question, someone's brave enough to ask a question, acknowledge that. And say, thank you. I'm really glad you asked that question because then people will see, okay, they're fostering an environment where I can ask questions, you know, because John, you, you know, right. Part of what creates innovation is challenging, challenging status quo, challenging the norms. And in m &A, people tend to, once the deal happens, everyone's worried, you know, they don't know what the future holds. They stop challenging and it, it cuts innovation right right from the get-go. And so, you know, a big part of the work that I do is to say you need to foster communications, but it's a different communications cadence. And a big part of it is fostering questions from people and championing those who ask the questions. Right. So we're <clears throat> alluding to folks um, at Mount Moore at the top of the house, but what advice do you have for frontline managers when everything's falling apart? or the perception that everything is falling. Yeah, it, and it does. It's, it's, it, perception becomes reality. And the advice I give to, to managers, and frankly, even people higher up, focus on what you can control. Because there's a tendency with the strategy, as we alluded to up front, the st strategy can shift and change as now people are getting into it and seeing what works and what doesn't. 
you can get really frustrated by that. But if it's out of your control, it, it, it takes up way too much mind share. And right. so I am always coaching and counseling managers, particularly frontline leaders, focus <laughs> on what you can control, you know, focus on your talent, your effort and your attitude, because you that know, that bring your team up with you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I cut you off. What were the things that you just said? My apologies. So no worries. The three things that you can control are your talent, your effort, and your attitude. That's that's what you stay focused on. Don't let the noise distract you because there's going to be a ton of noise. Um, you got to focus on what you can control, and then your team will will follow that lead because that's critical. Now, what? Okay, um, you know, because being in, in being involved in an M and A, there's a lot of churn. And there's you said noise and a lot of it. What does a manager do to dispel rumor or deal with rumor? So, um, you know, I, I think to me, it's role modeling the uh, the right behavior. Role n do not contribute to the rumor, right? <laughs> Don't give them credence because you can get caught in a spiral uh, of discussion. Uh, the majority of the time, the rumors are not true. Um, and, uh, you know, you probably uh, know this as well, right? And that's why I emphasize the communication piece. Because if you aren't communicating at an, on a frequent cadence, people make up stuff and they, they, will, they will assume the worst. They'll come up with more nefarious acts than you and I could probably come up with. So well, you know, that, that's, why, that's why your emphasis on communication is so um, important. I always like to say that uh, rumor loves a vacuum. And so when they're not hearing things, we, we make up stories, not to be malicious, but if we just, oh, did you hear this? And then by the time that's the telephone thing, I, st I said, well, maybe this will happen. Uh, maybe we're all going to be fired, maybe. And then by the time it gets to the 10th person, or maybe these right. days, the third person, um, everything is, none of us have a job. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So that's why communication becomes so uh, critical. So. And you, you know, you highlighted with your friend's story. Because uh, this happens a lot. I'll have leaders say, well, we don't we don't know. Right. We don't have anything to say. And I'll say that that that's not an excuse. You have to say, here's what we're working on. This is what we know. And that's the opportunity to say, tell me more. What are other areas? Solicit feedback, particularly if you you know, if you're working on solutioning on certain things, you need to get feedback and use that two way communication to keep the dialogue going. Let me ask you a question here. When a merger is going under, I mean, a, company A wants to buy company B or whatever, um, how much digestion or planning about the resources in company B is going on before the deal is made? Do Not you know? enough. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. Okay. It's, yeah. why, it's why actually I, I wrote, when I wrote my book, John, I just actually planned to write the book. I was going to go off and be a chief marketing officer somewhere else, but I had so many CEOs say, you know, this book is really valuable. We executives need to have better line of sight on what to expect yeah. and how to navigate this. Yeah. Um, so what if I, so when you're uh, on the acquiring side, um, I'm, getting, I'm, I'm thinking about another company uh, purchasing them and the deal is there. What should, what advice do you give to the, the buyer, shall we say? So, well, it's actually advice I give to both. Um, an exercise that I do that you're probably familiar with, but I just think it's critically important in mergers and acquisitions is a pre-mortem, right? So you act as though, hey, the deal's signed, we're done, right? And you have executive leaders from both sides. Now let's go through all the ways the deal could go wrong, right? Because I say even, let's think about military planning, right? M military, you're constantly drilling, who knows? Hopefully you'll never go to war, but at least you have done planning and drills to be prepared for any type of thing that might come at you. That's the same with the pre-mortem, right? So you might lose talent. A competitor might move faster on a product than you anticipated. The government might come out with some policy. So that's all of that scenario planning helps both sides have better line of sight on all of the things, all the variables that can impact a deal once it's signed. Okay. Okay. That's good. So um, getting back to the, the notion of the theme of this show is uh, grace under pressure, which is keeping it together. So you alluded that 
Um, how do we inject grace, the spirit of um, caring and commitment toward one another when everything is falling apart? So, yeah. Jennifer, tell me this. <laughs> Well, it's it's hard. One of the you know, you asked me the question earlier about how should leaders be uh, in an m and And one of the key uh, components is, is is having an empathetic mindset, mm. right? meeting people where they are, understanding that even particularly if you are a leader who has heard this news or uh, been aware of it for a while, your teams, the majority of the company are just finding out about it for the first time. So giving grace to people to catch up because people traditionally in particular who are acquired will go through stages of grief. They've identified with their company. And if they've been with that company for a while, it can be a strong identification. And now they don't, you know, if they've expected a certain future for themselves and now that's all into question, they go through a grieving process. So one of the key components of grace is giving them that that grace to go through that process. Okay. Well, how does one, um, what advice do you have for the acquiring, um, um, my language, the acquiring company senior management meeting the first time with a new team? What, what tips or techniques do you advise, Jennifer? So. The most important one is showing respect. Uh, <laughs> Traditionally, in mergers and acquisitions, the acquiring company tends to be arrogant. Doesn't mean, be, doesn't mean that the acquired company can't be arrogant. I will absolutely tell to you, Nokia and Naftec, we were both arrogant. Uh, you know, both thought we were the best. And, and frankly, I, I, I think we were. And that, that, that led to some of the challenges. So I am always coaching. When both sides come to that union, that partnership with respect for the other side, it gives that opportunity for collaboration to, to thrive for it. To the, the thought that it just popped into my mind and it's been used in terminology, but I couldn't help it as you were talking about two arrogant parties, whatever. It's basically a, a shotgun wedding. <laughs> so yeah. at least for the family, <laughs> yeah. the families on other side, suddenly we're, we're family again. And wait a minute. So um, you know what though, but that's a perfect a perfect analogy. I mean, it's when I talk about. It, I said, think about the partnerships, the marriages you most admire. They both respect. They both bring out the best in each other. That's yeah. that's what you want to look for in this M and A. If you aren't bringing out the best in each other and bringing the best of yourselves to this, it'll never work. Okay. Let's talk about the actually letting people go. So um, in company B, a, a size of the workforce, how do we ameliorate that situation? What do we, is it's it just perfect, severance? Is it what? You know? It's a perfect, well, let's go back to your point about grace, right? And uh, here's another example. I'm always fascinated when I, when I write something, what really takes off. Um, and recently I wrote about how do you treat people on the way out? You know, there are leaders who, who have a tendency to just badmouth them, right? Oh, they weren't worth it. Um, they didn't contribute anything. Actually, that kills your ability as a leader to lead the rest of your team because they see how you acted on that person's departure. So showing grace when someone leaves and it does, it, they might leave, leave of their own volition or they may be pushed out as a part of you know, the, the trying to find efficiencies and reduce redundancies. Sure. Pe just because people are let being let go doesn't mean they don't still have value. So as a leader, demonstrating the value that they brought to the company and treating them with respect has the people who remain respecting you and still wanting to work for you. Well, I, I think you sent an operative, opportunity. Yeah, an operative word there was value. Now, in honesty, when we have to let people go, whatever, due to headcount, whatever it is, they may no longer have value to the company, but they have value and dignity as human beings, and we respect them for that. Right? Yep, absolutely. And that's that's probably, if you were to ask me, what's the subtext for my book, Now What? It's to help people understand you still have value. Just because the metrics for success have changed, I've given you line of sight on here's how to find what those metrics are and contribute to them. But keep know your value and keep sight on what that is. This company right. may no longer be the company for you, but be crystal clear on what your value is. 
Now let's bring it again down to the individual level. And I think if I know your backstory well enough, um, is that you have been, um, uh, and through three, three mergers and acquisitions, um, and you were let go in one or two of those situations. And, yeah. and okay. So how did you deal with that? Or what advice do you have for people going through that? So. You know, um, and I really I'm not saying this because uh, this is grace under pressure, but I the other example I thought of is when you leave, if you if you treat it with grace. Right. So even the last one and I knew. Right. I knew um, because I, this was my third one. So I was like, oh, I've, I've seen this rodeo. I know how yeah. this will play out. Um, but people don't know how to act around you and people are nervous. So if you mm -hmm. act with grace. That invites them to talk to you. And, and I, I have to tell you, the, the last two that I went through, it was almost to the point where they're like, oh, we're so sorry. You know, like it was like, let's get you back. You know, and yeah. it was like, there's no role for me here. So it's yeah. okay. But if you treat that moment with grace, it allows people to, to talk and open up. That's a wonderful thought. You know, the, the quote, victim shows grace. Now, let's talk about what's going on in one's individual psyche. Even though you see this coming, okay, there is a tendency to personalize it. Is there not? So, yeah. so how, do you, how does one get over that? Well, okay, I know there's not a role for me, but really, I'm good. So how do you fight those thoughts, those self-doubts? So. It, it took me three acquisitions to get there. <laughs> you're not helping here jennifer <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm just saying that very first one particularly i loved my role you know okay. i was the head of b2b marketing globally it was the if you'd asked me to write my my ideal role that was it and i saw it literally dissolve um in 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 a couple of months and it was it was really hard but that's why i the advice i give is about you have to detach from the past you can't fixate on your past achievements. You have to know your value and look for the opportunities to contribute that to the future. But it took me, it took me a series and it's, but it's why I wrote my book because I thought I want to help people not go through the roller coaster <laughs> that you go through when, you know, you're, you're constantly questioning your value. Well, uh, this is, I'm going to flip that thing. It's not, it, it's not uh, as a reverse of the thing. It's, I'm thinking it's not, it's, it's not me. It's you. <laughs> You're the one that let me go. So I have to maintain my, my dignity. Correct. So, yeah. And I, you yeah. know, you, 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 you referenced it before. And I say, you have to think of it a little bit like musical chairs. Sometimes when the music stops, Someone has a chair and you don't have a chair. It doesn't mean you weren't deserving of the chair. It doesn't mean you didn't run around fast enough. It's just the music stopped and you didn't have a chair. And that's often how, how it feels when you're going through that post-deal time frame. No, and that's that's important. And so anyone going through an M&A, and I think, frankly, in some ways, we're all experiencing a, a kind yes. of M&A in the sense of uncertainty. Now right. what is a good resource? So, uh, Jennifer, you know, I ask every one of our guests um, a question about grace. So do you have one you want to share with us? So, Well, I feel like I've sprinkled it throughout. Um, really, <laughs> the, the one that I would I would just highlight because I, it, I saw the power of acting with grace as I left, right? As opposed to being bitter and upset um, by acting with grace, that had people open up to me and talk to me and even had our leadership come and speak to me, right? Because I handled it in a way that said, okay, they're not going to you know, burn, burn the building on their way out. Right. Um, and that, that for me was... Again, I, I attribute it to my mom. My mom was a great role model for acting with grace. And so I find that if you role model that behavior, um, other people will act, act the same in kind. You know, that's such a good example. And, and it's I haven't heard it a lot in all the interviews I've done. I would, you know, people talk speaking grace in many different ways. But in this instance, you're the one who was, I'll use the word, uh, wronged or slighted, whatever. And you show the grace. And that is such a powerful thing when we are perhaps hurting or feeling diminished. That's a time for grace for us. And that's where I think grace facilitates our ability to connect and re keep our humanity, keep our dignity. 
So. Yeah. And, and it, to your point, it changes the script and it mm. puts you more in control of what that, that narrative is. Um, and I lived it firsthand. Great. Uh, Jennifer, it has been a treat to speak to you today. Um, how can people find you? So you like find my house. <laughs> <laughs> I always love to say that, John. I know what you're asking, but I was like, <laughs> <laughs> no one's ever said that. One. That's a good one. You got me. I like it. <laughs> um, Really, I two ways. Um, yes, my website, which is uh, I know you'll include in the show notes because my my name is kind of tricky. Jennifer J. dot com. Um, and really on on LinkedIn, I really encourage um, people to connect with me there. I write a lot, um, uh, not just about mergers and acquisitions, but for leadership challenges in general when people are facing uncertainty. Right. Uh, Jennifer, it's been a real treat to speak to you today. So I say thank you. And with that, we will go out. Thanks, John.